welcome to this episode of the Martial Arts Studies Podcast. Today's episode mainly consists of a keynote lecture given by my friend and colleague, Dr. Ben Judkins, at the July, at the June uh, 2022 Martial Arts Studies Conference in Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, ben talks about the topic, he engages with the theme, the conference theme of martial arts tradition and globalisation. So the first few minutes are an introduction to Ben's work given by Dr. Daniel Jacquet. The sound quality veers in and out a little bit here because Daniel is walking uh, around away from the microphone. The quality of Ben's, the audio quality of Ben's um, presentation is great, as is the intellectual quality, of course. It's fantastic, fantastic talk. Then there's Q&A at the end. Obviously, audience members are further away from microphones and so on, so the sound quality goes in and out at the end. I decided to leave that because I think that some people will really make an effort to listen to that. Other people might just stop listening after the, the lecture. So that's your choice. Um, don't grumble about the sound quality um, or the noise of my dog um, shaking himself in the background there. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. It's a fantastic episode. Um, yeah. Have fun. Um, this is the eighth um, uh, in martial arts studies conference here for the first time in Lausanne. Uh, we are on time. Usually it's the case at the beginning of the conference, but since we are in Switzerland, uh, countries of watches, I'm going to make sure that you stay on time. <laughs> and now I am happy to open the scientific part of this conference. Um, with our first keynote speaker. Most of you already know him, but um, we were thinking on who best could open this conference on tradition and globalization. Of course, there is one name here. Ben Judkins um, holds a doctorate in political science and international relations from Columbia University. Uh, he has been a member of political science department at the University of Utah, where he taught classes on international political economy. And he's a visiting scholar at Colorado University East Asia program. He is also working for the US government in the Department of um, uh, Catastrophic Assistance. Disaster assistance. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, if there is a disaster here, maybe you can call your government. Um, <laughs> currently, he's the co editor of the Global Martial Arts Studies, and with uh, John Nielsen, he's the co author of The Creation of Wing Chun, the Social History of the Southern Chinese Martial Arts in 2015, uh, published by Sony Press. Other publications have examined topics ranging from um, 19th century Chinese fight books to the current growth of hyperreal martial arts movements. All of this research has paid close attention to ways in which individuals uh, have turned to martial practice and organizations as they have sought to navigate the economy and social shocks that accompany globalization. Uh, Judkins is the author of the long running martial arts studies blog, Kung Fu Ti, Martial History, Wing Chun, and Chinese Martial Arts Studies. Much of his research and writing outside the field of martial arts studies has focused on various aspects of globalization, globalization, including strategies of economic starcraft, statecraft, sorry, immigrants and refugee communities, and the evolving intersection of religion and politics. Then the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction. But I am here today to tell you a story. It was back in 2019 that my social media feeds, particularly uh, Facebook and YouTube, started to fill with reports of an intriguing new sword maker who was emerging in southern China. And after some diligent searching and then negotiations with uh, some American colleagues of his, I was finally able to secure an interview with him. And that opened for me a, a door into a new small community growing around the edges of the Chinese martial arts movements. Now, as anyone who has practiced these systems will know, it can be very difficult to find high quality practice weapons for the Chinese martial arts. 
Um, only in the last couple of years has anyone started to produce metal wasters, kind of blunt swords that you could actually spar with. And you could count on one hand, just I mean, literally probably three fingers, the number of decent, high quality, affordable cutters that were on the market. So naturally the appearance of a new sword maker with an entire line of high quality handmade blades for under $500 was something that absolutely everybody in this admittedly vanishingly small community was immediately you know, enthusiastic about. Uh, still, there were some obvious questions that had to be answered. Uh, for instance, the Chinese martial arts as we practice them today are really a product of the Qing and the Republic periods, really the late Qing at that. You know, we tend not to view them this way. We tend to view these things as being ancient and eternal and time uh, timeless. But the truth is the Chinese martial arts are a distinctly modern phenomenon, at least as you're likely to encounter them. If you want to get really, really old school, right, and say, I'm going to, you know, just, just focus on the classic fencing texts of the Ming dynasty, well, that might push it back to the late 16th, early 17th century. So at most, you're going to push this back into the early modern period. Right, but again, most of what gets done, you know, is a product of the Republic. So not surprisingly then, most mainstream Chinese martial arts equipment makers today focus on these very floppy kind of safety focused weapons that, that have been okayed for use in public forms competition, or they make these lower quality replicas of Ming and Qing swords that have, you know, very weak tangs, and they're not really set up to be anything other than wall hangers. So there has just been this huge unmet demand for high quality reproduction of Ming and Qing swords. It is thus really odd to dig into Ma's, you know, catalog. And I should preface this by saying, I actually, you know, interviewed three or four different people. Uh, but because of the nature of these interviews and some of the opinions that they expressed, not all of which were highly supportive of different aspects of, of policy of the Chinese government, uh, I'm not going to be using any of their real names. I have taken these three or four individuals and I have combined them together into one anonymous individual who we're going to call Ma for today. We'll figure out what we'll do about the situation for later. But at any rate, it, it is very odd that you dig into Ma's, you know, web page or into his catalog and, you know, what you discover are all of these truly archaic weapons from the Han Dynasty. Or maybe if he's feeling a little more modern, we might take it up to the Tang. But you know, we're looking at stuff that in general is about 2000 years old here, right? Um, this is not what the global market for Chinese martial arts weapons has been clamoring for. Still, the archaeological record suggests, suggests that back during the Han Dynasty, there was this very interesting, very robust martial arts culture that existed in China, where civilians actually carried weapons routinely in public, probably one of the few periods in Chinese history where that actually happened. Indeed, we have found more extent swords from the flooded tombs of the Han Dynasty than any other period in Chinese history. In fact, we have found more swords from the Han Dynasty than every other period of Chinese history put together. You can literally measure it in tonnage. We have found that much stuff, which is mind blowing. You know, we have like five swords that we can confirm came from the Tang Dynasty, but you, you, you know, you measure swords from the Han in terms of weight. We have so many, right? Um, so uh, again, you know, this then leaves us with this paradox. Yeah, we've got all this great material to draw on, but when I look at this, it's a very different from the stuff that most modern Chinese martial artists use. And B, when you pick it up and you play with it, you quickly discover it is not particularly well suited to modern Chinese martial arts. Um, so clearly that's gonna make selling all of this a bit of an issue. And as I would conduct my interviews with Ma, uh, this was always the first thing I would ask him about, right? And always the issue is how do you create a demand? How do you create a demand for this product, right? 
Um, and, and, you know, he was, he was very much aware that this was an issue. You see, the whole reason that you start a business, and, and Ma definitely has a business, you can, you can purchase stuff from him, um, is that, you know, he wants to make things and exchange them for money. But couldn't you make more money selling, I don't know, literally any other thing you could imagine, right? You could make more money selling any other thing than museum quality replicas of you know, Han Dynasty weapons for under $500, right? It is the most incredibly niche market you can even imagine, especially because you know, not just like martial artists, when you even get to collectors, nobody in the West knows that most of these weapons exist, right? And for reasons that we'll get into later in this paper, it is literally not legal to sell most of this stuff in China. Right, so, so what gives? Why are we creating a heritage industry that literally nobody wants, all right? And, and it's not just, as I said, it's not just one guy. It's now quite a few people. We, we have a little movement going on. So again, these are the, the, the initial topics that I would, you know, I would, I, I would tackle in my interviews. And, and it was really interesting because what I quickly discovered is that Ma and, you know, the, the people that move in his circle, uh, they tend to be very well educated, right? Uh, a lot of these are people who have backgrounds in engineering. And a lot of them would begin by describing to me um, their experiences with the traditional martial arts and their frustrations trying to break into or trying to advance uh, in the traditional martial arts community. I mean, very often family was a huge frustration for these guys. So uh, in one of my interviews, you know, talking about family, Ma said, you know, I come from a family of intellectuals, but I'm not the first guy in my family to study the martial arts. When my father went to college, he was into gymnastics and loved wushu. However, my parents now really oppose what I'm doing. As I'm sure you are aware, this is really common today with Chinese martial arts students, right? He added apologetically and then started to explain it was after I graduated from university, I came into contact with, I held my first authentic Han Jen, and it was a revelation. Real military weapons always leave this distinct intuitive impression when you hold them. When compared to Imperial Ming or Qing swords, that's what he means by Imperial, the Han Jen, it's, it's just superior. Its offensive abilities are all due to the quality of the manufacture and the shape of the weapon. When addressing his sources, as well as the kind of the materiality of his project, he, he went on to explain, you know, I felt that these swords could reveal something about the martial spirit of the Chinese people during the Han Dynasty. In historical texts or on stone murals, we see the huge popularity of swordsmanship in the Han Dynasty. Right, civilians actually collected and possessed large numbers of weapons, crossbows, which were kind of the machine gun of the day, his, his words, not mine, uh, could be owned by private people. It was fashionable to have weapons racks like, like that one, uh, you know, in your home. So from the standpoint of martial culture, again, this is still Ma speaking, almost none of the later dynasties could match the Han. For 400 years, the Han remained a strong empire. They never once lost a battle. That's parenthetically not true. Um, this is why I believe that the Han dynasty martial arts should represent China on the global stage, right? And it's a glorious vision. Right? It, it's wonderful to talk to him. All Ma needs to do is to convince pretty much all of the other Chinese martial artists in the world to go along with it. Or at least he needs to convince enough of them to take up this task of recreating this martial art. But it's going to be a challenge, right? We know, for instance, that multiple fencing manuals were actually written during the Han Dynasty because, you know, we see their titles in, in collections of books, but none of the books themselves actually survive. What we're left with is tons and tons of old swords, which is great if you're interested in doing kind of reconstructive archaeology, lots of artistic representations like this, because art survived really well from the Han period, as it turns out, and a vast historical silence just waiting to be filled by the imaginations of, you know, people like us, right? So 
you know, what he's really inviting us to do is to come along with him in, in terms of this vision of, uh, you know, the reconstruction or the, the creation of a new tradition. Okay. Nor is he simply calling on Chinese martial art people, folk to do that, right? Uh, increasingly, he is actually trying to forge communities, uh, try, trying to forge relationships with the HEMA or the historical European martial arts community, right? Um, you know, he, he likes how HEMA does things. He feels like this is a better fit to kind of get uh, a more realistic type of martial arts practice than what you might see in the Chinese martial arts. And so he's been spending a lot of time cultivating uh, relationships with people that you wouldn't naturally expect a Chinese sword maker to be that interested in. Right. Uh, and, and again, that that's that's kind of an issue. Why would Ma and these other cultural entrepreneurs, as I'm going to call them, because that's what they really are. Right. They're they, they've got a business they're trying to promote, but really their business is culture. Why would these cultural entrepreneurs feel the need to appeal to practitioners in the West when they are embarking on what is essentially a cultural revival project within China? OK, there is always a nationalist flavor to the, these discussions that I have with him. Well, Ma loves his exchanges with Western martial artists and collectors and sword folk. His discussions always bend back into the glories of the Han. And he makes it clear that for him, this is the ideal period to study because it was the last time that China was pure that it had no outside cultural influences. Parenthetically, again, not true, okay? But this is how not just he, but this is how lots of people in China imagine the Han, all right? This is a kind of common cultural trope. Why? Well, it was the last time that we could say that China was really truly the dominant global superpower. Right, you know, that there were no other countries thwarting its regional ambitions, that China had yet to taste defeat at the hands of the northern invaders that would just, you know, mark the entire rest of its history. By contrast, he has very little warm feelings about the modern martial arts. When he looks at the martial arts of the Ming, the Qing, the Republic period, he sees that these are all periods that are characterized. What defines them is China's very vulnerability and struggle. These were eras in which China was under the thumb of outside actors, in which it was dealing with very intense global pressures. So he asks me, look, how can you say that this, that this was the pinnacle of Chinese martial arts. It's ridiculous, right? Purity is this powerful idea. And Ma, like others before him, finds that purity expressed in the legacies of the Han. So we meet now our first paradox for this paper. Why is an appeal to the West critical in the creation of a heritage industry, a new heritage industry within China? You know, Matt Easton, a well-known HEMA instructor in the UK, generally all around great guy, became an important early supporter of Ma's work. And his opinions were very well respected. And, you know, honestly, if I wanted to learn 18th or 19th century military saber, Matt Easton would be the very first guy I would go to. He would be at the, at the top of my admittedly short list of people who know about this. Um, but ancient Han weapons, really, right? Why was it imperative for the success of this project that he developed this kind of an interest? For that matter, why did Ma go out of his way to begin to recruit Western intellectuals and Western martial artists for his project? Because you know what I discovered when I finally met him? I had spent months trying to find a way to connect with Ma, but ironically, he'd been spending that time trying to find a way to figure out how to connect with me as well. Now, to answer this paradox, this paradox, to answer this question, I think we have to start by inviting the Chinese state into our discussion. Simply put, it is the main obstacle, the main barrier, if, we, if you might, it is the great wall separating cultural entrepreneurs like Ma from the rest of Chinese society. If you wanna have an impact on Chinese society, if you wanna have an impact 
on the way Chinese martial arts are practiced, you have to get through the state. And of course, the modern Chinese state has also taken a leading role in shaping the national martial arts sector, which it views for its own reasons through a highly political lens. Uh, domestically, it has promoted wushu as a means of strengthening the body politic while promoting uniquely Chinese cultural values. So to learn wushu either you know, at the level of you know, a student at an elite sports university or more humbly just in your local junior high gym, one way or another, as you physically experience that training, you're learning what it means to be Chinese in a very non-trivial sense, right? You know, you as you grow stronger, you're kind of experiencing and taking part in the promotion of the state's goals. And, and you're feeling the state's goals, you know, you know, kind of carried out within your own body, which is always, I think, an interesting thing to think about. Now, given the traditionally tight association between the traditional Chinese martial arts and the formation of community identity and local identities, you know, and we see this really through the 19th century, early 20th century, this is stuff that I have written a lot about in a prior stage of my career. Given how important the, the Chinese martial arts were for that process of identity formation, it's not really a surprise that in the modern era, the Chinese state wants to insert itself into that discussion. And they're gonna do that by using martial arts as a tool to create this new relationship relationship for what they want to see is the relationship between society and the state. Yet Wushu has also proved to be politically valuable in the global, in the international context, as well as the domestic context. As early as the 1920s and the 1930s, the Chinese government, this is the prior Republican government, obviously, uh, was spending notable resources really trying to promote um, the new China, trying to use martial arts as a way of getting word out about all of the reforms and the modernization that had happened in China, exactly the same way that, that the Japanese had used Budo to do that, you know, a, a decade or two earlier. So they're very much following this Japanese model. And, and you know, given where this talk is taking place today, today and where we all came, you know, I should point out that probably the high water mark of this effort happens in 1936 when the Chinese government sends an entire squad of martial artists to the Berlin Olympics, where they are going to give what was a televised Chinese martial arts um, you know, demonstration at the Olympic Games to a very appreciative global audience. So the use of martial arts in diplomacy is not new. Right, this has been going on literally forever for as long as there has been an opportunity. Today, Chinese embassies throughout Africa and other parts of the developing world continue to be involved in very similar efforts. They sponsor martial arts programs and teaching. Um, they have study abroad opportunities. They, they run tournaments, right? You know, and, and all of these things can be seen as a fairly obvious attempt to promote Chinese soft power in the region. And of course, soft power is a term coined by the American political scientist and actually diplomat, uh, Joseph Nye, as he was attempting to explain, what would we call it, that, that kind of cross-cultural attractive force that generally successful countries in the international realm generate, where, where people want to emulate them, you know, be like them. Um, Although, differ, the, the view, the, the, excuse me, although diffuse, um, states have sought to cultivate soft power and then to turn it to specific ends through public diplomacy campaigns, again, for some time. Probably the most famous of these in the academic literature, the most commonly written about, is the American government's program of uh, yearly jazz concerts in the post-World War II period. So we would fly jazz musicians first to Europe and then all over the world. You know, we expanded the program, you know, as a way to kind of showcase some of the things that, you know, America and, and liberal Western democracy could offer during the, the height of the Cold War or, or the start of the Cold War. 
uh, when we look at what is going on with China today, it's, it's very clear that they're following kind of a similar sort of a program with Wushu. They have a Wushu, diplo you know, Wushu, Wushu diplomacy program going on where they're attempting to build soft power through the cultivation of you know, Wushu programs in other countries, bringing instructors back to them, things like that. Still, the single most, and it's so sad that Paul is not here for this. He would love to hear what I'm about to say, all right? The single most effective ambassador of the Chinese martial arts never resided within an embassy, right? Rather, the attractive force of Kung Fu, and notice I'm now saying Kung Fu rather than Wushu, right? Was ignited almost entirely by Bruce Lee, and it lives on in the media that he created and in all of the subsequent careers that he has inspired. Bruce Lee, however, uh, is something of a double-edged sword for Chinese diplomats. On the one hand, he did more than any other individual to make these systems attractive, to make them fascinating, to make them sexy. On the other hand, he made them sexy. <laughs> a lot of the values and the images that he is promoting are not exactly the same as the carefully curated package of values and images that those modern Chinese diplomats would like to promote today. And then there are some other problems, right? Bruce Lee was a very proud, one would say vocally proud Hong Konger. Bruce Lee was an American citizen. He wasn't a Chinese citizen. So Bruce Lee kind of has this, you know, complex historical legacy when we go to think about him and how he fits with soft power and cultural diplomacy. But that's important because it brings us to one of the, I think, most underrated cleavages in the academic literature around this, around how soft power actually works. I think what a lot of people don't know when they go and they start reading about public diplomacy or soft power is that a lot of these scholars, at least in the West, uh, in Europe and North America who write about this are actually escaped diplomats. They're scholar practitioners. They're actually like us in this room where we all, you know, we write about martial arts, but we also do them, all right? Well, it's kind of the same thing. They all spent years working on consular programs to promote music festivals and stuff like that. And then when they went back and got their PhD, yeah, they write dissertations and they write articles about, you know, the sorts of stuff that diplomats do. And so in their mind, and I think they're kind of trapped, in their mind, public diplomacy is ironically in the purview of the state. It's the state that should be doing these things. It's the state that should be supporting them. And you certainly cannot have a successful public diplomacy program unless you have a highly paid bureaucrat sitting there to you know, shake hands and manage it and make sure it all goes down. Other authors, however, Note that public diplomacy seems to really actually be most effective, meaning that it generates legitimacy, it generates soft power, only when the state vanishes from the equation, allowing members of a subgroup in one country to interact directly with a subgroup in another country. And the appearance of that diplomatic aid, you know, glad handing and smiling and, you know, introducing people, what that actually does is it undercuts the perceived authenticity of whatever cultural encounter is about to happen here. Okay. Uh, and in any case, historically speaking, ambassadors and their aides have proved to be kind of rubbish when it comes to guessing what young people in another country are gonna find culturally attractive. They don't generally bet on the winning horse. And so maybe it would be better if we were to leave cultural diplomacy to you know, cultural entrepreneurs, people who actually have their finger on the pulse of what is going on and, and, and literally have bet their own money on this. They know what the kids like these days, right? You know, They don't have to read a, a paper about it or look at a New York Times editorial first to guess what the kids might be into these days. Right now, it's not hard to see how the Chinese martial arts and the emergence of a new cross-border community, new cross-border trend, uh, would play into this argument that we're having. And when I initially planned this paper, 
God, what was it? Three, four years ago? <laughs> a long time ago, when I initially planned this paper, uh, this was the major theme I was going to explore, right? You know, we were going to kind of look at comparative theories of cultural and, and public diplomacy. But a lot has happened since then, right? We have seen the continued expansion of populist politics around the world, particularly in the West. COVID has introduced one of the literal horsemen of the apocalypse to us. Um, the supply chain struggles that were supposed to go away have not, exposing the fact that the global trade system is not functioning the way that we expect it to, and it probably will not return to proper functioning anytime soon. Uh, the current inflation issues are bringing up large questions about monetary mon uh, management. And of course, we now have, once again, great power war in Europe. All of this should make it clear to us, though I find people do not want to admit it, all of this should make it clear to us that we are witnessing a fundamental shift in the nature of the international system. All forms of cultural exchange in the post-World War II period have been mediated by a set of political institutions and economic market factors that since the 1990s, we have somewhat glibly referred to as globalization. The rise of this globalization acts like a transparent lens uh, that has allowed ideas and goods and people to cross borders at speeds that would previously never have been imaginable. Okay, now like all lenses, it distorts. Things never translate exactly as they were intended. But you know, that's, you know, as other people have pointed out, that's the nature of the process. There is no translation without transformation. And yet the ideas and the images and the people have moved. Looking at the increasingly tense geopolitical situation, as well as the pulling back from free trade institutions, right? It is appearing more likely that the liberal or neoliberal, depending on your perspective, global order that we have all been taking for granted basically for our entire adult lives is about to come to a close. And I don't know if we can manage a soft landing for this. It is not entirely clear what the next global order is going to look like. Uh, those are questions that are being debated in the halls of power. They're being debated in central banks. And of course, they're being debated on battlefields in places like Ukraine right now. Um, yet it stands to reason that this retrenchment, this transformation in the global system, in the nature of globalization, this is going to have a really substantial impact on soft power. And the utility of tools like public diplomacy or cultural diplomacy to get things done. As the costs of cultural communication begin to increase, there must be a, a corresponding decrease in the utility of tools that wholly rely on that medium. So rather than diving into a comparative exploration of different theories of public diplomacy, which again had been my initial plan for this, you know, as I sat down to actually do the version of this paper I was going to give, I think at this point in time, what is most critical for us in the field of martial arts studies is to come to terms with how this shift in the nature of globalization is going to affect the complex but vital relationship between local martial arts communities on the one hand, the state up here, and then the global body of martial arts practices and kind of the triangular relationship that we have there. To that end, it's interesting to note, getting back to the important stuff here, the swords, that this is not the first time that trade in handmade Chinese swords has been caught up in a moment of historical global transformation. Once again, Ma and his fellow travelers attempting to create their cultural revival movement, their cultural revival industry, um, are a great jumping off point for our discussion, but maybe a point of historical comparison is in order first. So let's start by thinking about the last time there was massive trade and highly utilitarian Chinese swords flooding global markets. Okay, 
And that would have been in the opening years of the 20th century. Of course, those arms were not recreations. They were not reproductions. They were the real deal. And they were seized in huge numbers following the failed boxer uprising. And they were brought back to the West uh, in terms of war booty and souvenirs. And they were brought back by the crate, right? They were brought back in such large numbers. You could basically get them through mail order catalogs. Uh, during the Boxer Uprising, you know, where most of the people died, was when, you know, a comparatively group, a comparatively well-armed group of imperial soldiers who actually had some of the most modern weapons in the world and had been drilled by European officers and had been trained by elite mercenaries, you know, directly confronted uh, Western armies and really put a dent in them. And this isn't what anybody talks about when we talk about the Boxer Rebellion, is it? No, what we're all interested in talking about and what really kind of struck people at the time, what got reported in the popular media at the time was something else that was happening, which was these vast groups of peasant martial artists streaming into the cities armed only with a sword or a spear and a very active imagination. Okay, and that is the tagline for the Boxer Rebellion that actually kind of took off in the West and forms our popular narrative uh, of the event today. And so it becomes the sword that is the, 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 like the, the key symbol of this period. So in the wake of the failed uprising, large numbers of these traditional weapons are seized and they're shipped back to the West where they're sold through auction houses and curio shops. And anyone with even moderate means who wanted to could go out and they could own a piece of what was up until that point, one of the saddest events in, in modern Chinese history if they desired. And even today, it is not all that difficult or expensive for collectors to find pieces that were brought back during the Boxer Rebellion that were kind of, um, you know, they're well documented and, and provenanced. I keep running onto them by accident. I personally don't like them. I, I actually have one in my collection, but I didn't think that that's what it was. And then it turned out, no, yeah, this is another boxer rebellion piece, right? And it goes without saying that this kind of commercial interaction, this collecting of these swords, what it did is it really, at the time, it reinforced Western beliefs about how backwards and ideologically dangerous China was nor were the boogeymen of paganism and the occult East ever far behind. So the, the collection and display of Chinese arms in the early 20th century, when this became fashionable the first time, um, this was practically an argument justifying Western imperialism rendered in steel. That's what's going on here, okay? It would be difficult then to imagine a more different situation than the production and the export of lovingly crafted handmade Chinese swords by Ma and others today. I mean, these things would seem to have absolutely no relationship to each other. And yet, right? The answers may be different, but I suspect that the unspoken questions that motivate current sword collectors today wouldn't really have been all that unfamiliar to collectors back in the early 20th century. Steeped in imperialist propaganda, uh, you know, in the daily newspaper, reading penny dreadful novels about the yellow peril, what Western consumers in the early 20th century repeatedly found themselves asking was, is China dangerous? And the fact that their arms seem to be 100 years out of date and you could purchase them in bulk um, after their defeat, you know, well publicized in the Boxer Uprising, seemed to offer us the reassuring answer, no, no, China is not dangerous. It's not really a threat, right? Not only that, it seemed to justify the imposition of a type of colonial dependence on China that was necessary to kind of forward the three M's of modernization, military rationalization, and missionary work. You know, and I love antique arms more than I probably should, right? You know, more than most people when you get right down to it. But it must be admitted that collecting an adversary's arms, their swords. In a situation like this, this isn't just a byproduct of conflict. It's a political act, 
right? It is the embrace of an imperialist ideology at the individual level. The indelible association between the blade and violence, not to mention the strong mythic resonances that such weapons tend to evoke in the modern imagination, suggests that the collection and study of weapons probably continues to carry with it uh, political resonances and connotations today. It's all a bit more subtle now, however. This is politics by subtext. We do not say, nor do we admit, how these, option, how these objects function in a social and a symbolic realm. For instance, today, currently, the creation and ownership of swords is highly restricted in Japan. It's, it's highly regulated by the Japanese government. Okay, um, explaining why would be an entirely different talk. It would be a fascinating talk. Someone should give that talk. But let's just say that the primary concern of, you know, the occupation government uh, in 1945, and then the subsequent Japanese governments that have come after that because they have carried on exactly the same policies. Their concern is not that someone is going to use a $20,000 Shinto Katana to knock over a convenience store, right? That has just never come up. That is not the reason that we restrict swords in Japan, right? The reason that we restrict swords is because of their use in really bloody horrific political assassinations throughout the 1920s that destabilized the government and destabilized the country. And everybody is afraid of what will happen if that starts again, right? That's the reason that we restrict sorts because they are such a potent political symbol. But of course we can't ban them outright because they're also a symbol that is absolutely essential to the modern Japanese identity. So instead what happens is the state inserts itself into this social process as states are wont to do, and the state regulates, it mediates who has access to the blade. And it does so in a way that it promotes a specific relationship between Japanese society and the state. It dictates who will wield the symbolic as well as the kinetic properties of the blade. So what do we desire when we find ourselves dreaming of finely made, obscenely inexpensive Chinese swords? Okay, let's start actually by putting some brackets around the Western consumers. We're gonna come back to them, um, but let's for the moment consider the individuals in China who are producing these things, right? What desires motivate them? Again, the concerns and goals of the state are actually what is setting the parameters of any of these discussions. On the one hand, the Chinese state has expressed a strong interest in promoting a certain version of wushu uh, as being able to produce healthy citizens and it produces a uniquely Chinese set of values and identities. And taking part in that training is one way that we experience what it means to be Chinese. And that process can be seen in many degrees in many registers in China today. You know, it manifests itself at Beijing Sports University with elite athletes. Um, we see it in Sanda, right? The creation of this modern combat sport with Chinese characteristics, if you will. We see it in the reimagination of certain traditional martial arts or folk practices as vessels of intangible cultural heritage, right? Everybody's favorite word at the moment. Yet, what you are unlikely to see in any of those settings is an actual functional sword or any other type of weapon. The security apparatus of the modern Chinese state looks on civilians owning weapons with a fair degree of suspicion. And that suspicion and those restrictions have been ramped up quite dramatically following a well-publicized terrorist attack in 2014, in which 10 knife-wielding Uyghur extremists managed to kill 31 individuals and seriously injure 140 more people in a single event in a train station. Just in case you're wondering why the Chinese police are so worried about this. Currently, the buying, 
collecting and use of high quality hand, handmade blades in China exists in what I would call a legal gray area. Now, Ma does not agree with that, right? As far as Ma is concerned, the state has made it illegal. There's nothing gray about this. But the truth is these things are bought and sold and there are a fair number of them that are changing hands you know, among private collectors, but it is highly restricted. Uh, in point of fact, it's actually easier, as near as I can tell, uh, to go and get an authentic, an original 2,000-year-old Han sword, right? You know, you, you can get that one shipped to you, no problem, right? That is fairly straightforward. Uh, these things are found in such great numbers that they're not particularly valuable for museums. They, museums aren't really interested in them. Uh, the government's not really interested in them. They, they trade hands for a nice example, maybe about $2,000 a piece. They just walk away from archaeological sites in, in very large numbers. And this is what allows fundamentally Ma and those other swordsmiths to have such accurate reproductions because they have four or five examples sitting in front of them. They choose the one that they like the most, they study it, and they make a reproduction of, of that particular one. So that, that you can do, right? And, and that's wh where we get this high level of accuracy. Still, when speaking about modern recreations, right, you know, including everything that Ma makes in his catalog, it is not easy to purchase them domestically, and it's not really possible to ship them at all. There have been news stories in China about the police intercepting shipments with really finely made uh, reproductions uh, of, of weapons. This has affected the nascent HEMA community in China, and subsequently educating the people who are attempting to purchase those weapons as to all the bad things about their hobby and why it would be better if they were to take up a different hobby, you know, maybe stone collection or ceramics or something like that instead, that the state would very much appreciate this. Uh, as a matter of fact, this has actually led to the installation of uh, equipment to, to more closely monitor mail so that, you know, these things cannot be shipped. And that has made it pretty much impossible for Chinese martial artists to get real weapons. Uh, individual shipping companies themselves, you, you know, so companies now outside the purview of the state are doing the same thing, right? They are also monitoring their packages and they are carrying out their own education campaigns uh, to assist martial artists in seeing the light about their hobby. All right. Uh, in an interview, Ma complained that recently one of his swords had been confiscated by a Chinese mail carrier when the raw blade that had just been finished in, you know, Long Chuen, when it was being shipped to Guangzhou, where another group of craftsmen were going to uh, fit the, the, the bronze pieces for the hilt, and they were going to do the lacquer work for the scabbard. Now, Having multiple specialist shops work on a single blade like that is very much the traditional method of construction for a high-end sword in China, exactly like it was in Europe, exactly like it was in Japan, for absolutely identical reasons. Not everybody can be excellent at everything, right? So you want to go to your specialists for your lacquer, for your bronze, for your blade work, right? And so pieces had to be shipped around. Uh, you know, and as Mr. You know, Ma informed me, it's also, by the way, a lot better if you don't let one single firm or contractor have all of your intellectual property, because then they can just clone your sword, make it cheaper, undercut you, probably make it shit, and you know, lower the esteem that Chinese swords are, are held in. So there's a lot of transshipment of components like this that are going into an export product. And that should be okay, right? You know, this is one company shipping stuff within its own firm for products that are ultimately meant for export, right? That should not be an issue. But even that, Ma has found, is coming under more and more pressure from the authorities. Still, the government has absolutely no qualms about the uh, export of large numbers of weapons from its post offices uh, to global consumers. It's actually Western martial artists and Western aficionados that are financing 
all of this. This is where all the money comes from. On the most basic level, when we think about Ma and the artisans who he supports, what we're seeing you know, is the development of a new cultural heritage industry in China. And this is an industry that even though it's often based on somewhat nationalistic themes and, 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 and you know, statements, you know, it's attempting to resurrect this glorious past before China had any foreign influence, yet it is entirely dependent on martial artists and collectors in the West to do this, right? It's dependent on their money to secure legitimacy in the Chinese cultural marketplace and to secure a financial foothold so that they can continue to do this, okay? But unlike that previous period of collection that we were talking about in the early 20th century, this is now a deeply cooperative project. Critically, it's not just about the money. I mean, yes, we're, we're dealing with Chinese small businesses, so money is really critical. But like I said at the beginning of this, everybody knows we could make more money doing literally any other thing you could imagine, okay? So there is something else going on here. As Andrea Mole argued in his recent book on Krav Maga and nationalism, there is no martial arts practice that is not on some level a political act. The intrinsic connection between swords and violence and community regulation really makes that obvious when we start to deal with weapons-based systems. And that's important as the Chinese state has seen itself and has put itself in a leadership position, dictating the terms and shaping society in order to advance its, its vision of the development of the nation. Yet martial arts communities in China traditionally helped to defend and help to shape and create their own identities in their own local communities. And their culture, you know, it, it's something that has never been forgotten. It, it, it's something that's still out there. They have their own ideas about what the ideal relationship between the modern Chinese state and society should be. Uh, scholars of the wuxia literature, so this is kind of the swordsman stories of the early and mid 20th century, have noted that these alternate models of political and social arrangements, they, they have been extensively outlined, right? They are well documented. People literally wrote books about this stuff, and those books became really popular, and lots of people have read them. And those ideas, in a sense, have never gone away. As a matter of fact, with the growth of the middle class, uh, and kind of the ability to think about some other things, they've probably gotten stronger, you know, and they've certainly resurfaced. We, we are seeing them anew. Um, perhaps the place where all of this is most obvious to casual observers of Chinese society would be in the Han Fu fashion trend. You know, speaking of what the kids are doing these days, uh, this movement is where we see young people, you know, typically urban, typically workers, you know, they spend their days off dressed in fanciful recreations of Han Dynasty, occasionally, you know, Tang Dynasty, traditional Chinese clothing. And the Han Fu movement, this, this fashion movement, um, consciously bemoans the loss of traditional Chinese culture while articulating a demand that China look back to a period when it was, again, the strongest state in the world when it was uncontested. Of course, these were also periods in which social structures and social limitations on individuals were very different than they are now, which is something that young people often find romantic. Um, they were periods when the relationship between individuals and communities and the state were different than they are now. And that's uh, often deeply appealing to somewhat you know, younger, often more marginal individuals. So the sort of subtle discontent that we see here, it can be safely expressed if you wrap it in enough patriotic layers, right? And that's what the Han Fu movement really succeeds in doing very nicely, right? It's openly romanticizing notions of a resurgent China reclaiming its place in the world. And this is something that all right-minded patriots should be thinking about. But what we're really doing is advancing a subtly different understanding of what the relationship between Chinese society and that state with its new place in the world, what it should be, how we are going to get there. 
other scholars, uh, you know, some of my colleagues at Cornell have already addressed the Han Fu movement. Um, I think what has been missed is that this same basic ideological framework can actually be seen in certain corners in certain areas of China's diverse martial arts landscape and perhaps nowhere more strongly than with Ma and this attempted recreation of a heritage industry. Because again, a lot of these guys actually have somewhat frustrated relationships with the traditional Chinese martial arts. But all the ones I've talked to are way into Han Fu. As a matter of fact, you could think of them as actually coming more out of the Han Fu movement and moving into martial arts rather than vice versa. Okay, so this is really kind of an exercise in self-creation that we are looking at here. Um, you know, and again, we see a lot of the same things that we discussed before. I mean, the looking back to the Han Dynasty, because this is a period in which China appears to non-professionals, to non-historians, to be absolutely unchallenged. A period in which you know China was a dominant force in the world, and as Ma is fond of saying, it never, never lost a battle. Now, critically existing literary works, surviving artwork, the archeological records, all suggest that this was a period in which very different things were happening, but it's a period that we don't know very much about. I mean, we have historically, I mean, compared to other countries, other parts of the globe, a lot of Han Dynasty literature, but nowhere close to what you would need to actually fill in all of the gaps and understanding what is going on. And that's important. Right, you know, there is a saying that the thing that makes a door useful is the hole in the middle. The thing that makes a historical period useful is all the things you don't know about it, right? It's the things that you don't know that allows this to become an ideologically contested space, right? Where you can insert yourself and you can insert your theories about what the relationship between state and society are supposed to be. And you can insert your argument about why having the state promote that goddamn terrible palu with the flashy floppy swords is such a bad idea, just for instance, right? So a variety of martial artists who are not happy with you know, what the state is promoting and the vision of the martial arts that the state is promoting are increasingly latching on to this. Ironically then, the very first step in your domestic reform movement uh, is to create legitimacy, to create a sense of desire uh, on the part of Western martial artists and Western collectors. You can't get directly to Chinese uh, social society because of the state. So we're gonna do an end run around it, right? What we need is to create that soft power, that social attraction, you know, in the Western world. Uh, and as that influences demands in domestic society in China, the government will feel that, and at least in the martial arts sector, it has been shown is actually somewhat responsive to that kind of public pressure. But now we see something really interesting going on here that again is different from how academics normally talk about soft power. We talk about soft power as being something that states generate and ambassadors wield, right? We already did that. And we talked about why that might be a bad idea. But now we're seeing the use of soft power domestically, right? It's not the state that really promotes soft power that makes soft power, it's individual actors, it's cultural entrepreneurs within the state that are responsible for the production of that. And one of the targets for soft power can be the state itself, all right? So there is this entire other level that you know we need to be thinking about we need to be going you know we need to be going over here in that sense i think when we think about soft power and we think about how it is used to manipulate these domestic political discussions there's nothing new about using foreign views of the Chinese martial arts to frame a domestic debate about the nature of Chinese martial arts or society or what these things should be. This has been going on for a very, very long time. This has actually been going on since the time of the Boxer Uprising itself. 
it seems that not only is the practice of martial arts an intrinsically political thing, but even the discussion of martial arts is intrinsically political. When you find yourself entering an era in which everything in global competition is in flux, Still, the values of different actors are not monolithic, and that means that during the periods of relatively liberal globalization that we enjoyed from, say, you know, some point in the 1970s until very recently, there was this unique window for cooperation between martial artists in China who had a set of goals and martial artists in the West. And we usually believe that we shared the same goals. We, we almost never did, that, that didn't happen. In truth, we all had different goals, but they were closely enough aligned that we could kind of you know, imagine that we were all on the same page, that we all had the same goals, right? The question that remains to be answered is, what will happen to these relationships that were forged in the current era as globalization continues to evolve or, or perhaps wither, right? The changing security environment that we're in today, especially when we look at Taiwan, the South China Sea and all that, it's promising to reframe the question, is China dangerous in ways that could have a profound impact on the practice of these martial arts in the West? And I think that this is the ultimate appeal uh, of, of Ma's beautiful handmade but very attainable swords. It answers the question of what do we desire when we find ourselves lusting after these objects, right? Recent contests in, between Thai kickboxers and MMA fighters and Tai Chi or you know, Wushu exponents have really put Wushu in a poor light, right? You know, Wushu has been humiliated domestically and internationally. And on a certain level, it's hard to square what we know about China as a rising global superpower on the one hand with such seemingly weak public martial arts performances on YouTube on the other, right? I mean, the two just don't seem to go together. Now, of course, there is absolutely no reason why a powerful state in the current age also needs to have a great boxing system. These things are not connected. We should all repeat that many times, right? It is not true. Uh, it was not true when, when the Japanese said this in 1900. It was not true when Teddy Roosevelt repeated it in 1905, right? It's just not the way it is. And yet disconnecting those two things creates a kind of mental asymmetry that we don't like. It's kind of painful on a subconscious level. All good things in our mind must go together. There must be one principle that makes sense of everything, that connects everything. And of course, that also applies to the martial arts. So as we seek to understand China's changed position in the world, on a purely emotional level, right, we want it to succeed. We want to see powerful martial arts, right? And this is what is bringing us to the actual psychological roots of what Joseph Nye was describing as soft power, right? And into this discussion, Ma steps with his beautiful swords, or in this case, actually more of a glaive, right? With his beautiful swords, he presents us with the answer to the question that everybody wants to hear. The only answer that would make sense in the current moment. Yes, he tells us, China is, and it could be dangerous. That's what you all wanted to hear, right? Yeah, it's dangerous, it's sharp. It had a brilliant past, it has an unimaginable future, but maybe you can be part of it, right? Maybe, you know, through the sword, you can appropriate these same values, you can make them your own. In that sense, we're actually in a very similar position to where we were at with the Japanese when, you know, Japan was a ra rise, raising, rising naval power in 1905 and judo was just beginning to become popular in the West, right? Should these you know, questions have answers? Maybe not. I mean, maybe the questions don't make any sense at all, um, but it's kind of obvious how people are going to construct the answers in their mind anyway. 
And I think this points to the continued potential of the Chinese martial arts and by extension, many nationally focused com combative systems. You know, as I noted in this paper, the fundamental issue that we have seen in the last three to four years is actually the decline of all of this, right? The decline of globalization. And so we find ourselves asking, you know, what is the future of Chinese martial arts going to be? Are people going to want to study Chinese martial arts when we find ourselves in a conflictual situation, you know, with them? And if you take a purely statist approach where you think soft power is something that ambassadors do, the future looks kind of bleak. Uh, if, however, you kind of view public diplomacy as something the public does face to face, well, soft power seems to have a lot more going for it. Because if we're honest with ourselves, which we, we of course make a living by never being honest, but if we're honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that the things that we find most attractive are not always the happy, shiny, liberal things, right? The things that we find most attractive are the things that we are afraid of. It's the things that generate fear, right? We want to be able to inflict that fear on others too. Right? That's the entire root, again, the psychological origin of this soft power argument. Right? And so in a perverse sense, in a sense that you might not expect growing conflict between China and the West, where China continues to look very dangerous, you know, could be the thing. You know, that, that really kind of sparks a revitalization or sparks new interest in this. You know, Ray Chow pointed out that Bruce Lee didn't happen in a vacuum, right? You know, the emergence of the Kung Fu fever that, you know, he kind of champions, it, it comes, you know, at the end of the slow defeat of the Vietnam War. So there is this dark side to social power. You know, it, it is not all liberal democratic values, uh, this dark side to, I'm sorry, soft power, you know, that again, Western scholars tend not to view. But it's something that the Chinese martial arts, I think, can help us come into, come into a little bit closer contact with. And at this particular moment in history, as we are seeing changes in the nature of globalization, and how you can then build communities across borders, right? I think we want to look at what Ma and his companions are doing and take very close notes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. I'm going to take three minutes of formal question and answer, and the rest of question and answer happens at the coffee. So, Ma, you have questions for Ben Zetri. Um, so let's go to the Old Testament of Kung Fu, right? Water margin, right? The other name of water margin, the other title that that novel circulated under is All Men Are Brothers, right? Not all under heaven, not everything in a direct lineal line, all men are brothers. It's a horizontal form of social organization. So right there, we're, we're going to have some issues. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, you pointed out how Ma and, and the other fellows often, I guess, are approaching the Western community um, for the reasons you described. Um, would you also say that the idea that you can reproduce these old artifacts of your culture, that you can reproduce the source, that that already was imported? Like, did they develop the idea by themselves, would you say? Or had they the Western models for European medieval source, early modern source being made and then thought, well, we could do the same for the Chinese things as well? Uh, that's a really complex and interesting question. They would like to say we're doing exactly what they did with HEMA, 
right? Because it, again, it would legitimize what they're doing, right? HEMA is legitimate. It's, it's doing great things. We want to be part of that. We're going to make ourselves part of this process. And it doesn't quite work because, you know, HEMA has these great books, <laughs> the books to tell you what happened and what it should look like and, and all this kind of stuff. And we had great books about the Han Dynasty, but they didn't make it, right? Instead, you know, all we've got is the weapons. And so I think what we often see people falling back on is an older pattern of how you appreciate antiquities in Chinese culture, because of course they've been reproducing their own bronzes forever, right? So Chinese scholars have been looking at ancient bronzes and reading the inscriptions on them and trying to figure out how they were used and try to figure out how to make them like, you know, that that's like, you know, what you did if you were a Chinese intellectual in the middle ages, right? And so there's a lot of that going on too. And I think that really kind of informs and inflects how Ma does these things. But if you were to ask Ma, he would say, oh yeah, this is Hema. Just, you know, the Chinese version. Yeah. I mean, they are very aware of what's going on with Hema. They just don't have any books to read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the last question. Uh, how come you didn't mention the chin? Um, well, I don't know because this that's not made the hand. That's what not what Ma's into. This is I, what made the hand. Well, you can you can take the question up with Ma. <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, I'm sorry, they, he, they are not the ones that he idealize, idolizes. I think actually probably the answer would be that um, their weapons are mostly bronze, and you know, all of these guys are are really interested in steel. And so they actually give the Chin a miss. They actually look to the kingdom of Chu a lot. And they're way into Chu because, of course, Chu is making steel swords. And Chu steel swords inform the Han. Um, but yeah, if I had to guess, it would be that they want to stick with steel rather than bronze. How come the, 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 the Chin were the ones that, that conquered the whole of Yeah. Remember the aircraft carrier I put up? <laughs> it does not matter how good your boxing is. That is not what makes you a major military power. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And that closes the question and answer. Thank you very much.